It's also a special privilege for me uh, because the suggested topic was in an area that I've been working in for a couple of decades and uh, which I regard as uh, of great and growing importance to the future uh, of human health and indeed the health of the planet upon which we live and depend. So uh, it's, it's terrific to see this topic coming of age, as it were, um, within the, uh, the formal discourse uh, among epidemiologists, and we'll be hearing more about it during the course of this, uh, this conference. My wife told me to clean these glasses before I left. I think they'll do. <laughs> right. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be in Alaska. It's my first visit here. Uh, and I too have come from winter uh, to late summer, but in my case, a considerable temperature differential between cold Canberra in Australia and um, here in Alaska. Alaska was always a rather romantic notion to us as children. We would read about it in um, our uh, early geography books. And I have to say this was back in the 1950s. Uh, but um, I think our main awareness of Alaska came from going, really going to, uh, to watch cricket matches in Australia, uh, where in the hot summer, the um, the main thrill for a, a young person was, in addition to watching some good cricket, uh, was to go and buy either an Eskimo pie uh, or an Alaska Delight. And these were ice cream uh, contraptions that were readily available during, uh, during cricket matches. Of course, the other thing we did when we were watching these matches was um, to sit there with our um, little bare heads in the Australian sun and if you've got good eyesight, you'll realize that up here, I'm not wearing Australian traditional headdress. I've actually had uh, the consequence of some of that early childhood um, solar exposure uh, dealt with by a surgeon in the last couple of weeks. Now, I'm going to run through a series of slides, predictably, uh, and I say run through because this is, a, this is a huge topic and I don't want to give just a blow-by-blow -blow account of the ways in which a change in climatic conditions and associated environmental disruptions uh, will impinge on human health. There are many ways, and many of you will uh, know uh, at least some of those from your own interests and work. So it, it is going to be somewhat of an overview, and I want to set it in a wider context anyway, uh, because I think it has some interesting implications for where we've come from as a discipline and where we might be going. Uh, and you'll see that when I show in a moment the, uh, the themes that I uh, intend to touch on. But before I um, embark on those, let me just also acknowledge Robert Cruikshank. Cesar has already uh, mentioned who he was and um, when he was involved with the, uh, the IEA uh, early on. Interestingly, for me, I noticed that um, one of his... Right, I won't make that mistake again. Here we are. One of the books that uh, he was involved with actually had this title. So uh, that's a nice connection. Now, these are the things that I uh, want to touch on, just to remind ourselves that our discipline is always evolving in response to changing social values uh, and the public health problems of the day uh, and the opportunities to work with other disciplines. Uh, we see various perspectives applied in our work. Um, we have a pretty strong tradition of still thinking mechanistically. It's come to us very strongly from um, the Western scientific legacy. Uh, but we've got to embrace systems-based thinking and, and research if we're going to deal with some of these 
more complex issues. There's always been the tension between whether we should be focusing our work on individual level factors, risk factors, for which we've done a lot of great work, uh, and or whether we should actually be taking more seriously research into the changing health experience of whole populations. And I do take that latter option very seriously. I think we've, um, uh, we've uh, under-recognised its importance in our work in epidemiology and for that reason perhaps some, uh, some of the changes that have come upon us, like the rise of overweight and obesity, uh, were really not thought about within a population context early on and our contributions have come rather late uh, in the, um, uh, the emergence of that problem. And there's a question then as to whether we're starting to see a paradigm uh, shift or a paradigm extension, if you like. I do want to talk about the Anthropocene. The word may not be familiar to all of you. Uh, it is a very important concept and climate change is integral to it. There are implications for the, um, the concepts and methods that we need to employ in our research uh, if we're going to tackle some of these larger scale and more systemic uh, problems in population health. And that, of course, brings us to the question of the role and relevance um, of uh, epidemiology as it grows in this 21st century. So uh, here's a representation of the Anthropocene. Uh, and this is only the last half a percent of uh, Earth's history, but you see there, as you move across from left to right, the emergence of the, uh, the human species within the, uh, the primate lineage. Uh, you see around 200,000 years ago, the emergence of our species particularly, and just 11,000 years ago, the shift from hunter-gathering to uh, agrarian living. And then in the, this most recent time of several centuries, what uh, is now being quite widely referred to as the Anthropocene, meaning the age of humans, a recognition that, to our surprise really, and inadvertently, we have become a geological force. The combination of numbers and intensity of economic activity is so great now that we're beginning to change um, the workings of many of the fundamental systems of this, uh, this planet, the Earth system. And inevitably, that has consequences for life support systems for us and for all species and for the stability and future of human society. So it's a big deal. Uh, interestingly, the Royal Geological Society in, uh, in London is now seriously considering uh, whether to um, officially deem this period that we're living in, the Anthropocene, and if so, arguing about when did it actually begin. Anyway, that's what the term means. And one way of um, viewing its profile is from this rather iconic diagram that appeared in the journal Nature a couple of years ago by a working group that met in Stockholm. Uh, and their assessment was that there are 10 great areas of concern with respect to the disruption, the depletion of um, planetary systems, uh, and that if these get pushed further and further beyond normal functional levels, that will take us into an unsafe operating space with presumably dire consequences. So they have attempted, in only semi-quantitative terms, to identify where the safe boundaries for each of these uh, sectors might be. And you'll see the three that um, scored worst on this assessment, shown in red, are climate change, biodiversity loss, and nitrogen cycle disruption. Now actually, climate change is in many respects more easily understood than the other two. Biodiversity loss is a huge, growing, and, um, uh, and, and rapidly occurring problem. And um, just this morning, I was looking through the literature on the consequences of the, um, uh, the, the declining populations of um, pollinator insects around the world for reasons we don't quite understand, but including the continued use of um, uh, neonicotinoid uh, insecticides. And um, 
possibly e effects on uh, habitat disruption and uh, climate change itself and so on. But uh, two-thirds of the, um, the foods that we depend on require pollination. And um, as Albert Einstein is said to have remarked, if all the world's bees disappear, humans could not last more than another three or four years. So the, these are big issues that are on the agenda. Sometimes the connections to health seem uh, tenuous, multi-staged, uh, but that doesn't make them unimportant for us as health researchers. In fact, it makes it more interesting, more exciting to get involved uh, and to work with a, a range of disciplines that many of us have not previously worked with. It's a great learning experience and uh, it's, uh, it's a stimulus for the discipline. And there is change afoot. Uh, the first meeting of the Planetary Health Commission was held a month ago, established um, in London by the Lancet Journal in conjunction with uh, The Economist magazine, not known for being left-wing and radical, uh, and with um, University College London. You'll see that um, the, the phrase that's being used is planetary health. It's not global health. That's a much used and much misused term, uh, often is old wine in new bottles. Planetary health is, is specifically about these bigger systemic disruptions and their consequences for the planet and for, and for human uh, health. And on the right, uh, again, a glimpse of this changing interest in thinking about the need to approach assist, uh, the, uh, the issues within a systems framework. This book has just been published in the last couple of months. Uh, it's very comprehensive and um, a very good account historically and uh, in the present tense of um, what this all means. And this looks a boring slide, but um, it, it's just to make the point that in fact the Lancet is now calling for papers addressing aspects of this issue for a special edition they'll be bringing out next year. And uh, shown in blue there, the, the dot points, are some of the topic areas that, that they're looking for research papers and or good review papers on. And you can see the um, objective of the whole exercise described in the bottom of the slide. It's about working towards a sustainable future. Now, this issue of um, paradigms, we'd all do this diagram differently, I think, but this is my attempt to, to run through um, the, uh, uh, the dominant themes in how we've thought about the determinants of health and disease over the, um, the last couple of centuries. And it is interesting, I think, to see that um, earlier on, and perhaps in a sense necessarily, a lot of the focus was at the community or population level, this more ecological interest in understanding um, trends and differences within uh, populations over time. And then from late in the 19th century, the advent of a much more uh, individual-focused uh, model uh, of health and disease, potentiated by the germ theory and by a number of other things shown there. And you can see as you run through the 20th century, the different um, streams that have joined the, um, the river. And then in the last um, couple of decades, the, the re-emergence of a, um, a more sophisticated interest in the social determinants of health and disease and the area that I'm talking about, the uh, question about systemic environmental disruptions. Now let me check my timing here because educationalists say, don't leave your most complex slide beyond about 15 minutes. The, the audience will be starting to drift off and think about afternoon tea. So here it comes. I'm going to build this up in three segments, but there is an interesting parallel, I think, with what's happened in the area of political economy and the um, evolution of uh, economics in our societies. And 
I'm not going to go through all the details here, and I've just indicated some of the key contributors to these uh, streams of thought, to these changes over time. But notice that um, in the early 19th century, political economy was a, a robust, comprehensive, integrative sort of um, area of inquiry and policy that was interested in the, the wider experience of societies in economic and political terms. And you'll see a big, strong arrow heading across there to the right, which will connect up with our story in a moment. But uh, notice that it then uh, split. There was a hankering to mimic the physical sciences and to go for quantitative finesse, modeling. Uh, and that happened, and it's led us into modern neoclassical economics, uh, which is now existing alongside the more recent emergence of ecological economics, which is saying, look, this is not just about values in marketplaces and exchanges between fully informed buyers and sellers. This is about behaviors in human societies uh, dependent on the wider natural environment, the imposts upon which our economic activities ha have not been accounted for in the marketplace. We need to understand fully the consequences of our economic activity within that ecological framework, not just externalize those costs and say, well, someone can pay for those in the future. And it's I think beginning to happen now that we're seeing the emergence of a sort of sustainability economics as these streams come together again to some extent uh, and realize that uh, because of what's in that red box at the bottom, there's a case uh, for again moving ahead. Now, if we run through the same story for um, public health and epidemiology, again, early on in the uh, around um, 1800 in the early 19th century, uh, considerable emphasis again on that um, uh, uh, that community-wide, that social dimension of um, of health, and you see the names of Villerme, Rudolf Virchow, who did the famous uh, study in um, Prussia of um, the um, uh, the, far the farm workers and the typhus epidemic, and said that it was all due to poverty and oppression, for which the Chancellor did not thank him when he reported to Parliament. In London, uh, England, Engels, William Farr. But at the same time, the emergence of um, what we regard as the roots of our more formal discipline via the um, comparative studies that collected in, uh, information at small group or individual level, Semmelweis, John Snow and others. And so we've had a strong stream running down there on the right-hand side uh, now, a biomedical uh, model influencing um, uh, how we think about health and disease, specific causation, uh, and its um, increased sophistication uh, into what we've referred to as modern epidemiology, quantitative risk factor epidemiology. Uh, and on the left, um, with it, um, the social determinants uh, perspective has been there but rather overshadowed, but coming to the fore again in recent times as, as a very important uh, dimension of where our work should be um, uh, leading our thinking. So that I see emerging from this, um, of course, the future development, methodological development of the sort of work we've been doing in modern epidemiology, uh, but a, uh, an important uh, and newer strand of work that is more systems-based taking a wider perspective of environment and society and trying to understand in less precise, but in my view, often more important terms as to uh, what the major determinants of uh, health and disease are and are likely to be for the foreseeable future. Now, there's a little bit to go in the middle. Just an interesting connection that coming uh, out of the work of... Um, Malthus and the early um, uh, social demographers, um, the stimulus to Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, that 
led to the theories of natural selection, uh, and also application to um, growing concern about um, possibilities of fertility control, um, particularly as a, um, as a women's right, a human right issue in um, uh, the transatlantic setting in the, uh, the uh, 1870s, 1880s, and making a connection, of course, across to, um, uh, to our, uh, our area of reproductive health. Now, this is also a little complex, but I'm going to simplify it in just a moment. But it, it, it's a recent, quite a good recent example done by um, a group in Auckland, New Zealand, part of the climate change story, a project called Peddling for the Planet. Now, just um, several slides about climate change itself. Um, I say this quite immodestly. This is a sort of heroic slide I put together a year or so ago from multiple sources to try to capture um, the, the story over the last uh, 12,000 years. Uh, the Holocene is shown there. Uh, relatively stable climate, but you can see uh, at this macro scale variations of up to plus or minus three quarters of a degree centigrade. A couple of big plunges there showing them. Um, uh, in more recent times, uh, the right-hand side of the graph is tenfold expanded. It's in centuries, not millennia. Um, major cooling events lasting for five to ten years due to huge volcanic eruptions, and each of them having some very interesting consequences uh, for human health. I'd love to go into the details, but the 536 um, CE or AD event uh, appears to have facilitated um, the, um, the passage of bubonic plague uh, from northeast Africa across the otherwise impassable Nubian desert or up the coast of the Red Sea to survive and get through to the Mediterranean coast where it then went across to Constantinople with the grain ships, rats, fleas, grain, um, and uh, broke out in 542 in uh, Constantinople, wiped out... Uh, uh, a third of the population within three months, and uh, then spent the next uh, two centuries rumbling around um, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire and uh, the Middle Eastern region and uh, uh, north into parts of Europe, killing something of the order to 50, 70 million people. Lots of interesting stories here, but the point is the climate always varies naturally. But uh, have a look over there on the right-hand side and you'll see something that's being imposed uh, on top of that natural variation, that um, sharp continued red line over the last um, uh, three or four decades, um, substantially human-induced warming, best estimate is about 80 to 85 percent of the warming is due to human action, and then the, um, the dotted graph showing where it could go by later this century. A lot of uncertainty around that, uh, but there are concerns now that um, we're going to find it very difficult to stay within the so-called plus two degrees centigrade safe level, and it's quite possible that we'll be heading for plus three or even plus four degrees centigrade uh, by the um, end of the century. Those would be temperatures we've not had on Earth for tens of millions of years. This is not a trivial change. This would be long, uh, uh, a medium to possibly long-term change that would uh, enormously stress and disrupt um, the environment, um, the natural systems of the planet. Here's the Arctic. There's the 1990s sea ice. Now, if I showed you the um, 2011 sea ice, it would be about half that area. It's been melting. Oh, here we are. Hello. But warming has pre been proceeding rather faster, at the nor uh, uh, or considerably faster, at uh, northern latitudes. And that's why the focus of this conference here in Alaska is to ask questions about the, the current and future prospects for um, uh, human health and the health of the um, systems uh, around us. Now, here is an example of the sort of projections that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has most recently made. Uh, 
Um, this is from a family of four different scenarios that have been used. This is the highest and the lowest emission scenarios. And you can see over there on the right-hand side um, that, again, there's a, uh, a likely increase of anything between about 1.5 to 4 degrees centigrade by the end of this century. We're not sure, but for the moment we're tracking uh, much closer to that red graph uh, than we are to the blue graph. Using one of the intermediate scenarios, this is the sort of um, warming picture that's envisaged uh, by 2070, thereabouts. And again, note that uh, up there in the, the Arctic region, we're talking about uh, a plus three or four degrees centigrade well before the end of this century on not the extreme emission scenario, but on one of the medium emission scenarios. You can see it's uneven. Most of the warming is occurring in the north where most of the land mass is. Uh, interesting cooling going on around the fringe of um, parts of Antarctica. We have the privilege down at that end of the world of having the Great Southern Ocean. It's the only latitudinal annular ocean in the world and fierce winds come around there. And they're getting fiercer as um, the energy of the climate system increases. Uh, they're stirring up the... Um, uh, the uh, surface waters causing turnover in the oceans and bringing up the cooler waters from deeper down. Um, that's one of the co contributory factors to this, uh, this more localised cooling. Many others, as ever with the, the climate system, it's a complex story. Now, you might say, why would I put my name on something as sparse as this? I'm going to build it up. This is um, my view, but it's one we generally share amongst the epidemiologists working in this area, that we've got uh, three main pathways, often called primary, secondary, and tertiary. The simple one that we're all familiar with is the, um, the direct impacts on um, uh, things like um, injuries and death and mental stress from extremes of heat, heat waves, and from uh, other extreme weather events, the um, ongoing apparent increase in, in intensity um, and perhaps in frequency of things like cyclones, storms, floods, wildfires, a lot of this in the United States, of course, in recent years. And then we move up to the... Um, top pathway where we're talking about the initial disturbances, disruptions, depletions of natural systems around us and firstly how that then plays out by influencing various critical biological and ecological processes uh, that uh, affect food yields, the nutrient quality of food, uh, the um, activity of bacteria, uh, the transmission of vector-borne infectious diseases, the flow and the quality of uh, fresh water and so on. And then the third one, harder to study even more. But again, likely to be very important. We're talking about major and fundamental disruptions in many parts of the world, ultimately all parts of the world, uh, to ways of human living, uh, supplies of resources, stability of systems, and stability of geopolitical systems. So the implications are wide-ranging, um, and there is um, uh, a budding line of research now exploring the, um, the, the likely probabilities of tensions and uh, open conflict uh, over resource shortages, particularly to do with food and water and often on a transboundary uh, basis. The Arctic, I've mentioned that the warming is proceeding faster than average here and will continue to do so. I've just listed um, in uh, four different categories there the types of uh, consequences, 
for communities and for, uh, for the health of populations. Some of them can be reasonably direct. There was an early report in the 1990s of um, uh, the coastal waters around this part of Alaska having been unusually warm for a sequence of seven or eight years and um, having created conditions whereby uh, the, um, uh, now what was it? It was Vibrio parahemolyticus, um, a diarrheal disease, Vibrio, was able to survive throughout summer and multiply and infect the oyster beds. And they had serious outbreaks of um, food poisoning. Uh, Alaskans will be pleased to know it was predominantly in tourists, not in Alaskans. But um, that's, that's a, a relatively straightforward consequence of warming of coastal waters with its knock-on effects for bacteria uh, and seafood quality. You can read through this, uh, this list and see that all of those um, are very plausible and there's evidence for a number of them already happening. Under that second category, the, um, the consequences of a, a shift from traditional native foods to um, uh, imported, highly processed, refined foods. Uh, there is quite a literature on that now, associating it with the, um, the changing uh, patterns of um, daily life and, uh, uh, and health in a number of these more, uh, more northern communities. The reindeer herders. This was a story I encountered when I was in um, uh, Sweden and in Norway, right up north at Tromsø. Um, and um, the story there was that uh, with the ice becoming thinner, more precarious, the traditional reindeer herders were losing some of their herds. They'd venture onto the ice and all fall through and many would drown. A serious loss to livelihood, a serious loss of source of protein, uh, and of course a um, likely cause of uh, impoverishment mental health and, uh, and other related um, health disorders. Now there's a, a big challenge for us in terms of attributable risk in uh, many of these areas and uh, I understand um, uh, from Kirk Smith who's with us in the audience today and Alastair Woodward, the two co-chairs of chapter 11 in the recent IPCC report on the impacts of climate change chapter on health, that um, the way that we tended to uh, be ready to attribute, make reasonable attribution of a climate change influence on some health outcome uh, was not immediately acceptable to scientists working in some other areas. If you're a glaciologist and you're studying sea ice melting, uh, I mean, how many reasons can you think of for ice melting? Right. But how many reasons can you think of for um, malaria rising up the, um, the slopes of um, the highlands in Kenya? Seven, eight, nine? It's a multivariate situation. It, happened, it has been happening in association with warming. What portion of that change do we attribute to warming? How do we go about doing it? The same question arises with them, um, as I've shown there in the uh, rectangle, with issues around climatic influence on, uh, on food yields and the flow on through prices, access, family diets, nutritional health, child development, stunting, increased risk of death. It's a complex pathway. A group at the London School of Hygiene have actually made a very good attempt uh, to model is quantifying each of those links, coupling with sub-models for trade, changes in trading practice and so on, and have estimated um, with, uh, you know, with a, mod a moderate but not excessive confidence band that um, by the middle of this century uh, in sub-Saharan Africa the p where s food insecurity exists in many places, the um, uh, the proportion of child deaths occurring that would be attributable to the climatic impairment of food yields in the first instance 
will increase from about 8% at the moment up to around 16, 17% by mid-century. Now that's just a first go at it, but there's very important work for us to get involved in, in trying to work, work out how best to provide a socially useful answer to this question that will guide future discourse and policy making. This is not an academic exercise, this is a response to a, um, a big and urgent issue that's pressing on us. Now one interesting example of um, uh, an, an extreme event, a heat wave, is this one because it has elements of all three pathways to the primary, secondary and tertiary. Firstly, this was an extraordinary heat wave occurring in um, Moscow and uh, Western Russia in general, causing um, tens of thousands of extra deaths, also uh, wiping out about one third of the, uh, uh, the wheat crop. So that um, not only was there the direct effect of the heat, but uh, secondly, the regional population was under food stress, just a, la a lack of, uh, of grains. And in a more distant sense, this had great impact on conditions in, um, in Egypt at the time, just a little before the Arab Spring uprising. That was early 2011. But in the preceding um, few months, Russia had banned exports of wheat and Egypt had been its main importer and there was serious grain shortage in Egypt. This has been now quite widely studied and um, reported in the literature. A very interesting example with n no absolute certainties about it, but a very plausible, diffuse connection of uh, this extreme heat wave with um, uh, social and, and, and subsequently health conditions in uh, uh, Egypt. So it's uh, an example of um, the many pathways that can be activated. Now, for a lot of this work, we need um, to engage in scenario-based modelling. We're looking to the future and we're talking about an, an exposure complex that's going to change continuously uh, and that introduces the need to use future scenarios of, of emissions and of population growth and patterns of economic activity to try to estimate then how across time the risks to health will evolve. I'm not going to go through the technicalities here but you can read through those and just see that um, this is a sort of simple how to do it for a building uh, testing uh, and applying these models. And it's that sort of modeling that has been used in this study, recently reported. Um, notice the familiar graph up there, top right. I've just added that in. It's a, I'll come back to that, the interesting shape of that in a moment, the, the Goldilocks or comfort zone, just right phenomenon. Um, but notice that um, uh, the question here was how will the balance between reduced cold-related deaths and increased heat-related deaths, how will that change over time? And from this modelling, the answer that this group gave uh, is summarised in that box. That um, with the passage of time, the, uh, the heat effect will progressively overwhelm um, any benefits from the reduced exposures to cold. This is a slightly simplified version of, um, again, the sort of use of um, models, some of them formal, some of them intuitive, for different major outcomes of climate change on human health over time, three different time periods. And you can uh, see uh, in the present tense shown there, top left, that um, uh, there are estimated adverse impacts occurring already 
And for weather disasters, for example, there's that inner yellow segment saying, even with the best adaptation, you know, the, um, the best protective um, or, or um, in institutional capacities, um, this would be not reducible any further. Now, as you move out to the 2030s, 40s, it's still a period of committed climate change. There's a lot that's in the pipeline, a lot of warming still to come. It hasn't yet been manifested at, um, at Earth's surface. Uh, but for the while, um, a, there is this committed period. And um, this group, this chapter team, estimated that the major increases would be in the areas shown there in that um, yellow box. And then carried it through to towards the end of the century, showing um, where the, the likely major impacts on human health will be. Um, that's for a four degree, plus four degree centigrade world, which is now, for the moment, a quite likely outcome. So we are beginning to get better at um, bringing the information together and modelling it where we can and making these sorts of estimations which then uh, have uh, social utility. Notice that um, the, the whole area is uh, characterised by these Goldilocks effects, the, the just right, the porridge not too hot, not too cold, but just right. There are comfort zones for many of these biological phenomena that are so critical the things we're looking at. Top left, barley yields. If it gets too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry, the yields fall off. Then you can see diarrhea and rainfall, top right, and you can see the story for malaria in that bottom panel, showing how acutely sensitive the rate of development of the plasmodium, the pathogen in the mosquito, is to a, a change in temperature and effects on daily um, survival and biting rates and so on of mosquitoes giving you on the right that sort of picture of how malaria transmission actually has been observed to change in the Solomon Islands in West Pacific in relation to temperature. So there's a great deal of nonlinearity in all of this. Similarly, a, a model as for malaria was built up in China, a biologically based model uh, on the um, survival of the water snail in relation to changing um, temperatures in water and not being able to survive um, uh, in frozen water. And their best estimate with this model is that um, these, uh, this water snail transmitted disease of schistosomiasis uh, will spread further north and, um, and, and west into the blue area in China by the middle of this century. And then there's food. Now this is um, projection of um, uh, cereal grain yields, which account for well over half of total caloric intake in the world. But uh, again, it's a, it's a very uneven picture, isn't it? And uh, whilst there might be gains in the green areas, a lot of areas are um, scheduled here um, by mid-century for um, downturns in yields. And that includes Australia. Uh, this is not just the... Um, uh, the, the the poor and tropical and, and uh, subtropical countries, it's those that are typically prone to drought, and that includes my country, Australia. Now, that's modelling just using the, the, the most accessible input variables, temperature and soil moisture. That's the classic model of, uh, of um, photosynthetic product. But we haven't yet found ways of bringing in these less predictable, more stochastic influences uh, on yields. They're all important, though. Cyclones in Vietnam occasionally wipe out half the rice crop. Pests and diseases do spread, and coffee crops in Central America are now under, under pressure from a, a pest that's spreading, um, uh, spreading with temperature change. So big issues with respect to food. And then as I come to the end, just a reminder that it's not all about the identification of risks, the projection of future risks. 
the identification of vulnerable populations that um, must be paid particular attention. It's about the primary prevention, which is mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, or drawing down more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via um, revegetation, reforestation, better management of our soils. And it's about adaptation, dealing with the, um, uh, the managing the risks that are unavoidable. It's said that adaptation is about um, uh, the, the um, managing risks that are unavoidable, and that mitigation is about avoiding risks that could become unmanageable. I won't talk in, in detail about uh, these, except you, you can infer by reading through them that there are interesting, tangible tasks for epidemiologists here um, in um, estimating reductions, changes in burdens of disease in response um, to a a adaptive strategies, for example, and in helping societies to decide who's the most vulnerable, what will, what's likely to be the most effective. And then mitigation, the real primary prevention option. The good news here is that many of the things that countries, local populations can do, like getting out of cars and onto bicycles, for example, have immediate health co-benefits for that local population. And again, the more we can identify those uh, and quantify them, uh, the better placed we are to make um, a persuasive contribution into the public discussion about why we ought to be getting on with this job of mitigation just as quickly and radically uh, as possible. The diet one's an interesting one, and I've done quite a bit of work on that one myself. Uh, these ruminant animals, the source of um, pretty much all of our red meat, although we eat a few kangaroos in Australia as well, but the, the ruminants that have the four stomach um, generate a lot of methane. The average Aussie cow produces about 400 litres of methane a day. Uh, now I say produce, I'm not sure what you're thinking, but it's actually a front end problem. Not how the cartoonists like to see it. But if you read through that list of blue points, you'll see that there are many opportunities for uh, epidemiologists to be engaged now in doing this sort of work. And there is a lot of work now developing around this question of estimating the, the co-benefits for local populations of taking these, um, these necessary actions. So, I didn't ever think I'd show quite this sort of slide because I always groan when somebody at the end of a lecture sh starts to show four, four whole slides worth of all of their messages. I'm not going to do that, it's all on one. Uh, but it is a few words. Um, but in my humble opinion, uh, these are important messages. That we are a geological force and climate change is just one signal of how we're disrupting uh, the planet's workings. That poses diverse health risks. And most of those need to be thought about in the first instance at the, at the community or population level. This doesn't fit immediately into the classical modern epidemiology risk factor paradigm. We're talking about different types of environmental change that impinge on communities at large. You might think about the origin of the word epidemiology, epidemos, upon the people. It's not upon the person, it's upon the people. The second set of um, messages is that I think this comprises a challenging and morally compelling research agenda for us and to work with interesting other disciplines relevant to the topic. Standard, our standard methods are, are good for a number of aspects, a lot of good work on heat extremes and uh, daily deaths, mirroring the work on air pollution extremes and daily deaths. Many other opportunities for 
uh, for our familiar type of epidemiology. But the purple areas are the areas that we need to be growing into, engaging in, helping to develop. And again, I've talked about all of those. Systems thinking, the need for modelling, future change and risk, the criteria of causal attribution, um, and optimising the management of now un, uh, unavoidable health risks via adaptation strategies. So epidemiology must engage with the widening ongoing paradigm shift into systems-based research to elucidate and, where possible, quantify key paths, processes and intervention points. And this will be a socially useful exercise, as I've said several times, uh, and I think um, we should look forward to being able to develop the discipline in this area, extend it, I should say, into this area, um, and uh, achieve some of the great successes that uh, ought to flow from that, of the kind that have flown from uh, the more familiar modern epidemiology that many of us have been brought up on uh, and have practised. Unusual slide to finish with, I guess, but just a reminder that uh, we come from a long way back. Uh, the primate line's been exposed to unusually fluctuating climatic conditions, particularly over the last two and a half million years uh, as the homo genus has arisen. And um, that uh, variation in natural climate has exerted a lot of selection pressure on human cerebral capacity, brain capacity. And I conclude by saying we must now use that um, rather extraordinary, complex brain to set about the business of countering human-driven climate change. So I hope that becomes a major part of the task for epidemiology in the 21st century. I thank you again for the opportunity of giving this lecture. <laughs>